So, um, okay, so we're, we're back in the chapter of, um, we're going back to Mark, Mark 8. I know we went on a little mission to go into James, but you could turn to Mark 8, and I'll bring you kind of up to speed what's going on with Mark. Um, for some of you guys that don't know, Mark was one of the youngest disciples with Jesus. He was a kid. He was like 12 or 13 years old. Um, he, from, the, from his reading the Gospel of Mark, the one that wrote this, he, um, he had ADD or something because all the stories are very fast and to the point, which I like. And you go to the Gospel of John and it's like, you know, each chapter is long. Mark's just boom, to the point nuggets. And uh, he is actually one of the, I think he's the only streaker in the Bible. Oh, no, Joseph was one of the streakers. Yeah. Joseph ran out from Potiphar streaking mm-hmm. and... This uh, Mark was in the Garden of Gethsemane when they came to arrest Jesus, and he was in his tunic, which is like a little dress robe kind of thing that they used to wear back in that culture, and he tried breaking out when they tried to arrest him, and they grabbed his robe, ripped it off him, and he ran out butt naked. So he's one of the streakers. Um, I think Jeremiah, too, he was, God had him get naked or something, right, and walk around, do some, something crazy. I forget how that whole story goes, but he wasn't a streaker. Um, Mark was. So... Uh, he was a kid, ADD, running around butt naked, typical. So, verse, um, before we go into chapter 8, I want to just kind of bring you up to the speed of what Jesus has been up to. And I'm going to go back to chapter 7, verse 31. Uh, Jesus left Tyron and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee, which is, it was the Sea of the Gentiles, or the Galilee of the Gentiles, and uh, the region of ten towns. Now, ten towns, back in Mark, we read about where Jesus showed up on a boat, and there was a man that was possessed with many demons called uh, the Legion. He came down running to Jesus. He was living in a cave, cutting himself, and they would put shackles on him, and he would break them. The dude was out of control. He had, we don't know exactly how many demons, but it said a legion of of demons inside this man, and and Jesus rolled up on the set and basically said, what's your name? He said, Legion, because there's many inside of us. So Jesus sets the man free, casts the demons into the, to the pigs on the side of the cliff. They run down and they drown themselves. And that actually, when you go to Israel one day, when you do, you'll actually see that's the only part of the Sea of Galilee where the cliff actually runs down and it actually turns into a cliff and goes into the ocean. Because the rest of the Sea of Galilee, it, it just goes right into the, right into the uh, sea. There's no cliff. And that's the only place. And it's right next to the synagogue where uh, Jesus was teaching. And there's actually a graveyard there where the where the guy was living. So that's, that's basically around that area. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't in 10 towns. After the man got set free, then he came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, you set me free. I want to roll with you and the disciples. Take me with you. And Jesus is like, nope, you ain't coming with me. You need to go back and talk to your friends and your family and let them know what the Lord has done. And then this man was one of the first missionaries. He went out, then went to 10 towns, and he started letting everyone know about Jesus and what he'd done. So he already prepared the way, similar to John the Baptist, preparing the way for Jesus. He went to the ten towns and prepared the way for Jesus coming. So verse 32, a deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him. And the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on them to heal him. So these people already knew about Jesus because this dude already came and said, man, I had a legion of demons in me. I was out of control. And Jesus set me free. So when Jesus rolls up on the set, they go... Hey, dude, this guy's deaf. Let's get him to Jesus. So verse 33, Jesus led him away from, away from the crowd so that he could be alone. And sometimes when, sometimes when, when you got issues going on, you just got to be alone with Jesus. You know, you just got to have that time and just, just pour out your heart to him. And so Jesus was like, hey, man, just here. Come with me. Come with me. Let me, let me take you over here. He put his fingers in his mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. He put his fingers in the man's ears and then spit on his own fingers and he touched the man's tongue. And probably some of you guys are going, dude, that is disgusting. <laughs> he gave him a wet willy and then <laughs> put it in his mouth and said, speak, like, this is disgusting. But what I love about this is when you read about Jesus, he never healed people the same way all through the Bible. Because if not us dumb humans or get caught up going, oh, well, this is the way, you know, we got to do it like this because this works every time. But by God's sovereign grace, he heals people in all different ways. When we were in Israel, we were at the Beatitudes, and after my dad gave the message, um, Lacey came up and played a song, and as we were singing, one of the guys that went on the trip with us, he got a dirt bike wreck before we even went on the trip, so he couldn't even move his right arm. He was worked. But as he was singing the songs, 
There, no one laid their hands on him or nothing. When he, when, when he was singing the song, next thing you know, he said he felt warmth come over his arm and down his arm, and God healed him right on that spot. Just by God's grace. Yes. Thank God it wasn't a, you know, one of those things. <laughs> he got lucky. But it's just God's grace. That's how it works. So moving on, looking up to heaven, Jesus sighed and said, I, I can't even read that word, which means be open. He said something. What's it called? What's that word? Huh? Ethafa? Ethafa? That's what Colin said back there. He's a Bible school guy. Ethafa. So we'll see. Anyway, which means be open. Instantly the man could hear perfectly, and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd, do not tell anyone, but the more he told them, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed, and they said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. So going in, and I love what he, they ended here, everything he does is wonderful. And isn't that the truth when you truly find God and he's doing stuff in our life? Everything that he actually does in our life is wonderful. It is, it's unbelievable. But you don't really experience that until you're fully committed to him to, to get those, those blessings. So now we're in chapter 8. So Jesus is doing things in this town. So the first one, it says, about this time, another large crowd gathered. Okay. Well, you know why they gathered? Because Jesus is handling business right now and, um, and healing people. He's casting out demons. If you read about in Luke 7, 18, it talks about John the Baptist. He was in jail and he sent his disciples to go see if Jesus actually was the Messiah. And when they showed up, they saw Jesus. He was healing people, casting out demons, raising the dead. And he told, he told his disciples, go back and tell John, this is what you've seen. And that's that he was doing the, the will of the Father. So God, Jesus is doing these things. There's a major crowd. And if Jesus was here, I mean, obviously he's always here with us. But if he was in physical form and he was doing these miracles, this place would be jam-packed. Thank God that he went to heaven and now he's always with us wherever we go. We don't have to go search to find Jesus. He's just everywhere. Where more than two are gathered, his presence is there. That's, that's, the, that's the dope thing about Jesus. And the people ran out of food again. So these guys are out there. There's a major crowd and the people ran out of food. So these guys are pretty committed to seeing what's going on with Jesus. Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. They have been here... They have been here with me for three days, and they have nothing left to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will, f they will faint along the way, uh, for some of them have come a long distance. And now today, I was, I don't know if some of you guys, when you read the Bible, but you just kind of sit and meditate and go, okay, God, like, I read what's going on here, but like, Holy Spirit, like, what, what, what do you want to say to me? So I'm, I want to reach up to you so I can give out to these guys. What are you trying to say in this, this little text? Because I read it. I get it. There's people there. There's a big crowd. You know, he's telling the disciples, you know, they're hungry and people have been there for a long time. But as I started sitting there meditating, thinking, God, like, what are you saying in this situation? When he went to the disciples, I believe that Jesus was teaching the disciples ministry and how to care for people. Yeah, he was healing people and he was hanging out and he was putting his time in. But he called the disciples to let them know there's more. You have to actually care for people and, and love on people and, and be aware of, of what's going on with them physically and that they're spiritually and all these different things. And then it goes on to say that they were with them for three days. Now, when I think about the multitudes, there's always people in the multitudes. I think there's three kinds of people. There's the people that are dedicated disciples that are here and expecting God to move in their lives. And then you have the ones that are like, yeah, it makes me feel good to go to, go to church and hear about Jesus. You know, my girlfriend loves it, even though I don't really care or do anything that God says. Call me one of those Christians, you know. I'm the feel-good Christian. I go once a month, you know, put the time in. And then you have the other guys that are just kind of off from the distance, kind of just checking out what's going on with Jesus. But when I started reading this about these multitudes, you know, these guys were, these people were there three days. And when it talks about the multitudes, later on it's going to say there's 4,000 men there but plus women and children. So it could have been up to 12 to 13,000 people. And these guys, this multitude that was there, even though God was doing a bunch of miracles, these guys were committed. They ran, this is like their second time running out of food. So they're there because God, Jesus is speaking the truth. He's healing people. And you know there was musicians there. If there was 11,000 people, 
You know, they were having jam sessions. I mean, Jesus was launched the first crusades or the first music festivals with, with speaking back then. I mean, it was, it was going off. So he's basically, these, these multitudes are sitting there and they're committed for three days. And when I thought about the commitment that these guys have, how some of us don't even have the commitment to come to church once a week or twice a week. And we're like, oh God, you know, bless me and help me and speak to me. But they don't have even a commitment to read the Bible or a devotion in the morning. Like the way these guys are set up for three days, if we just put our attention and, and try to go for God, when we wake up, God, what do you want to do with my life? Read your devotion, say a prayer, and then talk to God on the way to work, work, do your thing. And then, you know, read at night, get plugged in church twice a week. You'll see God move just like he moved right here with these multitudes. I mean, he was shaking up the place. But the problem is, when's the last time you committed three days to God? When's the last time you committed, you know, when last time you were trying to read and you turn your phone off? Just from being distracted from stupid Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or emails or whatever you're into, when's the last time you just put airplane mode? Or even in church, you know, I, there's, there's people I know that come to church and they're texting the whole time, and they're like, yeah, man, I'm a Christian, and they know the scriptures. They could quote every scripture. They know the Jesus stories, but they're here in church, and they're texting the whole time, and they don't even have real communication with God. You're like, it's like, what are you doing? What are you seriously doing? You're, you're in church texting, and you're not even paying attention. You're putting the time in, but you're, you're not here. You're not hearing what God has to say. So if you're listening, God's speaking to you right now. Amen. Go to airplane mode. Dang it. <laughs> Security, grab them right there. Grab them. Just joking. Um, so uh, then in the, the third part I, I picked out was that when Jesus was saying that these guys are weak and he was actually, you know, if they take off without feeding them, that they're weak and they might faint on the way home or, or collapse or whatever. Jesus cares. He's looking into our weakness. He knows our weaknesses and he's aware of, of um, our needs. And not only did he do his thing there, but he's like, you know what? I, these guys need food. I need to feed them. So, you know, no matter what we're going through, you guys, sometimes you feel like God doesn't know what's going on in your life or this and that. He's aware of every aspect. He wants to speak to you. He wants to heal you if it's his will. He wants to um, be there in your sorrows. He wants to be there when you're happy. He wants to be there in your weakness when you're hungry. You know, if you're, you got to pay rent, mortgage, you got to depend on God. And if you're short, I've heard so many stories where even my parents, you know, back in when we lived in Azusa, you know, it just, it, my parents, you know, it, it, was, it was crazy. My dad was starting his Kung Fu studio and it was, they were like, didn't have any money. And they didn't know, they didn't even have money for me to be born, put it that way. And they prayed and someone like put, I don't know how much it was back then to have a baby. It was like 400 bucks or 300 bucks. They didn't have it and someone literally showed up and put a check for the exact amount in their mailbox and the people would drop off groceries when they had no groceries for the family. Like God speaks, you guys. And sometimes we get in the place in our lives where we're like, God, I need help and I gotta try and fix it. Well, your first problem, you're saying I. <laughs> you know, number one problem, you gotta say, God, help me. And God will speak to different people and lead people by the spirit to reach out and help you or he'll, he'll provide for you one way or another. He's, he's in the business of doing miracles. So he, he's in the details, you guys. Verse four, his disciples replied. So he, you know, basically, he goes on to say, for some have come from distant places. Um, and then verse four, it says, his disciples replied, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out, of the, uh, um, out here in the wilderness? Okay, so this is the disciples' first problem. How are we, okay? We, I, all these, these words are bad words when it comes to following Jesus. We got to get we and I out of here and get our eyes on God. Now, I'm going to read chapter four, uh, verse 4 again. His disciples replied, how are we supposed to find enough food to feed them out here in the wilderness? Well, obviously, these guys aren't paying attention to Scripture, the Old Testament. That's what they had back then. Genesis 1.1, let's start there. God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? These disciples are, how are we? Disciples, you ain't going to do nothing. We, um, who's going to do it is God. Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if God spoke into existence the heavens and the earth, 
is he going to have a problem feeding these 11,000, these measly 11,000 people? Don't you think it's a little bit more difficult to go, God, you know, let there be earth, let there be water and all the millions of animals and the, the bugs and the insects and the dirt, and the dust and the heavens and the sky. I mean, I think that was a little bit harder, but nothing's hard. God just spoke. It's like, okay, son, boom, son, you know? So there's that. And then these guys obviously aren't studying the scriptures of Ezekiel or, um, uh, Exodus and Leviticus. I'm going through that right now with Papa Chuck. Um, remember, he took them out of Egypt and they had no food. And they're like, why did you bring us out here to die? So God starts sending manna from heaven to feed them. And then they're hard-hearted. They start getting pissed off at God and going, hey, God, we can't deal with this manna no more. We want, we want some meat. So God's like, all right, quail or doves. I think it was quail. Send some quails. And then they eat, them, eat so much that they get sick and throw up and they're over it. Then the second thing is, <laughs> this really, what I thought about really spoke to me is like, just two chapters ago in Mark, Jesus fed 5,000. He fed more. So now these disciples, he's like, like, he's already done it for you, hard-headed dummies. Like, do you want to see it again? And we can relate so much to these disciples because how many times have we been in the situation when God's done something crazy, get you out of jail or you know, gets you the, the job you've been praying for, or whatever it be, and you're like, how, how am I going to do it, God? How am I going to do it? And he's like, you ain't going to do it, dummy. I got you, because I love you. You're my child. And then he gets it, and he does this miracle, and you're praising God, and then you find yourself in another situation in your life, whatever it is. And you're like, oh, God, how are you going to do it? What are you going to do? And he's like, you know, Jesus, he has a sense of humor, you know? He's probably, I, I don't even know what he's doing. He's probably just like, this guy again, dude. This dude, Ryan, like, ser are you serious? How long have I been with you? I delivered you from drugs. You're doing stuff you didn't even dream about. I brought you the, your wife of your dreams that, you, you know, you don't even deserve because you're, you know. <laughs> you don't even, but, you know, he's like, I've been doing miracles. Ryan, what's your problem, you know? So he's probably looking at the disciples, and he's just like, dude, I just fed 5,000. I just healed the leopard. I just... um. Healed the deaf man, remember the wet willy and the tongue and the whole deal? Like, I'm, I'm handling business, you know? And you guys are tripping on feeding the 5,000? So Jesus, Jesus basically asked them, and Jesus asked, how much bread do you have? Seven loaves, they replied. So Jesus is probably going, all right, here we go again, you know? Here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how, how handling business. And when I started thinking about these miracles that Jesus is about to, to do right now, I started thinking, reflecting back on my life, on miracles that God has done in my life. And I want to share some of these stories with you guys to encourage you guys, because I want this night to be a night of encouragement. It's just surrendering to God, following Jesus. And I was talking to these dudes in the back. It's like, sometimes you guys, we got to make get in that uncomfortable spot. And that's when God works. Like, it's so easy for us to get go to our jobs, get off work, come home, do your thing at work. You know, I don't know if you surf, skate, or gym, whatever you do. And then come to church on Thursday nights, and you're like, God, I'm a good Christian, you know, I'm going to church, I'm getting fat off the word of God, and, you know, when the rapture comes, I'm, I'm ready to roll, let's do this, you know? But Jesus is probably like, dude, I got so much for you, dude, you're just like wasting your time, what are you doing? You're like a fat cow, just ready for slaughter. No, yeah, I'm going to scoop you up, I'm going to take you to heaven when the horn, you know, when the trumpet blows, but I got so much for you, and I started thinking about these faith situations in, in my personal life, and there's a lot, but I, I got a few that I want to share with you is, you know, a couple years ago, we were in, um, the door opened, my friend, uh, Tony something, I forget his last name, Tony from, uh, he's from Calvary Chapel downtown, he's one of my good friends, so he's going to be pissed because I don't remember his last name, <laughs> Tony, uh, Tony downtown LA, does anyone know his name? Avia, no, no, Trujillo. No, Tony, David Trujillo. Tony Trujillo is the skater. David Trujillo is the pastor. So he called me up. He said, hey, homie, I got this thing in L.A. Go to Huntington Park. We're going to do an event, this and that. Bring the bands and be tight. And I'm like, all right. And I'm like, well, I'm also, how are we going to do it, dude? Where's the budget at? And he's like, oh, dude, I don't got no money. I got like 50 bucks, homes. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't going to do nothing with that, dog. So I'm like, hey, you know what? I'm going to Huntington Park to the high school. I go, okay, dude, if God's will be done, we're going to go, and we'll just pray and see what bands will commit to it, and well, let's just see what it's going to cost to make it all happen. So, you know, I, I know I put events together. I do concerts. Dude, stage, sound, lighting, um, minimum, flyers for the kids to, to invite the kids, 
And um, I mean, that's minimum. And then, you know, if the vans come for free, that's rad too, but there's still gas and hotels that are coming from out of town, travel, whatever it is. So we just start praying. We're like, God, if you want us to go, then open the doors, dude. We're available. Let's step out by faith. We're going to just step out by faith and, and start contacting people and see what happens. Well, it turns out, dude, the bands did it for free. We got three POD into the plane, head played, and then like two other bands played. Then the guy from the Staples Center that sets up the events there got a hold of us through a friend and said, hey, dude, he's like, I'm going to set up the whole stage for free for you guys. I'm going to set up the sound for free for you guys. I'm going to set up the backstage for free for you guys. I mean, it was like being at like K-Rock Acoustic Christmas or like K-Rock um, Weenie Roast in the backstage, like full on like, like pimp backstage chairs and food. I mean, this is not a high school. This is, we weren't even there because we were with the kids, but it was tight after to eat tacos there. But, uh, you know, they provided, they provided all this stuff, but the thing is, is building up to the thing, we're like, hey, this is awesome, God, we're, we're doing this, and then all of a sudden, dude, three days before, I get a phone call, and they go, hey, man, some kid just got shot in the face at Huntington Park, and I'm like, dude, this sucks, man. I'm all, well, we gotta go, and, and we're gonna let these dudes know about Jesus, man, that there's hope, and they go, well, this is the problem. You guys can't have your event unless you guys get metal detectors, and we're like, metal detectors? All right, well, whatever. How much are they? They go, 10 grand. I'm like, 10 grand in three days? Dude, I was in my house. I was living by myself. I'm like, God, what the heck is going on? Am I in sin? What, what's, what's happening? Am I not following you? Am I like out of line? Like, 10 grand? Where am I going to get 10 grand in three days? Are you kidding me right now? And I just felt, and this is the best place to do. You fall on your face before God, but you're... Put your face in the ground, your head to the ground, and you start, God, let's do this. What do you want to do? What's going on? If you want us there, then you open the door. And we prayed. And I, I, I promise you, I, I was going to use the other word. I promise you not. Um, or whatever word you translate that. I get a phone call. And it's my friend. And she's like, hey, what's going on? And we're just talking. We're chopping it up. Hey, how you doing? I'm just talking about her life. I'm not, I don't tell people. I'm waiting for God to show up. So we're just talking about her life. How are you doing, Ryan? Oh, I'm doing good. Everything's cool. We're, you know, we're just, just hanging out. I didn't even bring up this school thing. So after talking to this girl for an hour, um, this is the lady that, that you know, we've worked with in the past. At the end of the conversation, I'm like, all right, well, hey, I'll talk to you later. At the end of the conversation, she's like, hey, hey, hey uh, well, the reason why I called is because... Um, She's like, God, you know, God spoke, I feel like God spoke to me and, and he told me that, uh, you know, that to give you $10,000. And I don't know if that makes any sense or anything. And I'm like, I'm like, well, actually, I was just praying before you called me. And I was, anyway, I told her the story and she's like, awesome. There's a check in the mail. You'll have it in the next two days. I'm like, cool. So God provides, right? Well, it turns out, so God provided for that, and she ended up. She ended up sending uh, 11 grand, and what's crazy is I forgot to tell her we needed Bibles. So she actually threw up another thousand dollars, which actually provided for Bibles for all the kids there. So God even worked again, even again on that whole situation. So then there was another situation where we did a bird of your flesh tour all across the United States. We went from LA to you know, Portland, Oregon, and then back through the middle of the states to New York, down to Miami, and back to Texas and back. And we did uh, 36 stops in a month and a half. I mean, it was murder your flesh. That was the message, kill, kill your flesh. And I had the rep with me. And basically one of the stories on that is uh, we were driving down to Miami and we get a flat tire in the middle of like, no, somewhere like in Virginia, like in the sticks, in the middle of nowhere. We get a flat tire and do literally we are late. Like, we got to make it to Miami in, in the right time. And we're, we're pulled over and we're like, okay, God, we're going to miss the event. If we just got a flat tire, we're, we're done. So we start praying. We're like, God, do a miracle, please. And we're in the middle of nowhere. So we're calling people and they're like, hey, man, you got to get a towed. Then we don't even carry these tires because, you know, the, you brand new tires, like, I don't know, it was ridiculous. Like $2,000 for an RV tire. And, you know, you got to ship them here. And it's this whole nightmare. And we're like, okay, well, the whole tour just got jacked. So we call. I'm like, you know what? Just call a local liquor store and see what they can do. We call the local liquor store. Or not liquor store. Ga ga a gas station around the area. 
<laughs> gas station. We call them and we're like, hey man, this is what's going on. This is the RV. This is the tire. What can you do? The guy goes, oh man, I'm, I'm like 30 minutes from there. He's like, dude, we actually have a, almost a brand new, that same exact tire. It's like brand new here at the, li at the liquor store, the gas station. <laughs> so dude, homie drives it over, takes it off, sets it up. And literally, dude, it, the, whole, the whole cost costs like 700 bucks. But we're like, dude, God, we didn't even have money to come on this tour. We don't have enough to pay for the whole trip. Now 700 bucks for a stinking tire? Dude, we show up. We show up to the place. We speak that night. A girl comes up to me after and goes, hey, um, God wanted me to give you this $700 check. I'm like, are you kidding me? These are miracles, you guys. This is miracles, OK? I'm out of my comfort zone, and I'm depending on God and going, dude, what are you doing? OK, well, just, just do what you're doing. I'm, that's fine. Just keep doing it. Don't worry about me. I'll mess it up. So then another story is um, we're, uh, we're, we're, um, we're, we're going through these hills by Pelican Bay or Pelican Prison, Pelican Prison up north. And we're, we're coming from, um, what is it, Oregon, Oregon. And we're going through Pelican Jail. And we, get, we start going through these winding hills. We get lost. The GPS messes up. We start going through these windy hills. And next thing you know, me and the rep are in the back. And I don't get car sick. And we're like, oh, man, I'm sick, dude. Pull over, man. Like, I got to get some fresh air. And these hills are winding. It's pouring down rain. So we go to, we stop. And all of a sudden, we see a car pull behind us. We're like, hey, dude, what's up with that car? They just pulled up behind us. You know, like, just watch out. You know, I had to, like, pull the little billy clubs out, you know, in the name of Jesus. Um, <laughs> So this, this girl comes running up and starts pounding on the door. Bah, 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 bah. Hey, the whosoever's, you guys, the whosoever's? Because our bus was wrapped, the whosoever's. So we open the door, we're like, what's up, what's up? They're like, are any of the whosoever's here? And we're like, well, all of us, we're all whosoever's. Like, yeah, we're here. <laughs> and they're like, OK, hey. Um, she's like, can we talk to you? I got my husband. So she grabs her husband. The husband comes in, and he's just all like, just like, something's not good with this dude. So they walk in, and she's like, listen, I just want to tell you the story. She's, she goes, I've been following the whosoever's for, the movement for three years online. And she goes, I've been praying to the Lord that the whosoever's would come up into this area. And I was out front with my husband and we see this bus drive by and I go, hey, what did that bus say? And he's all, I don't know, like the whosoever's or something. She's like, get the keys, we're following them. So they, they pin it, they start ch chasing us for two hours through the hills. And because of our GPS, we got lost. So we ended up going by their house because we got lost. Get it? God's like with the spirit, like, here, guys. <laughs> Orchestrating. And next thing you know, we, uh, she, goes, she goes, literally, she goes, we were, the, the, the husband goes, look, it, literally, he goes, I was driving. And I, he goes, I just prayed to God. And he goes, I, he goes this is to tell you the truth. He goes, I'm, I've been walking with God for nine years. He's like, I'm, I'm backslidden. I'm a, I was a pastor. And things happen in my life, and I, I actually, I'm not a Christian. And he smelled like, you know, booze and the whole deal. And he just looked like a mess. And he's like, but I, he's like, literally, right before you guys prayed, I, right before you pulled over, I was in my car. And in my mind, I said, God, if you're real and you want us to talk to these guys, have them pull over. And he says, immediately when I said that, the RV pulled over. <laughs> so, so they get out, and we start talking to them. And the girl's like, I'm just stoked that you guys are here. And I'm like, OK, cool. So I go, hey, let me pray for you guys. So. We anoint them with oil. We lay our hands on them. As I start praying, God starts giving me words to speak over this dude. And next thing you know, the guy just starts bawling. And I just go, hey, man. I go, you know, he starts telling me a story. And I said, look, dude, God loved you, and he has a plan for you. And, dude, he accepted Jesus right there back on the spot. And a year later, he came down to uh, L.A. to visit us. And he actually is the pastor now, and he started a church back in that area. So we didn't even have to go there. And then two, two last stories is um, there was another story of um, broken even. There was another story is like even like the Start This Shine event, you know. I'm like, you know, uh, Brian, uh, you know, Chuck, Chuck and Brian actually had me start doing the Shine once a month on Saturdays here. And it was awesome. Like, that's just a miracle that God even opened that door. And I remember telling God, I'm like, I'm going to start a study down in Orange, because I live in Orange County for, you know, the last 20 years. I need to start a study in Orange County so I can meet my wife, because but my dad's church. That's too far, you know? I ain't driving to the LA area. I need someone local. I got problems, you know, only 10 minutes away. I only date girls in 10 minutes radius. <laughs> and I made a joke, and like, God, literally, I met my wife the first night of Shine. Like, God's like, <laughs> laughing, like, sense of humor guy. Oh, yeah. Look at that, Ryan, huh? Like that little miracle? Cool. 
So I go to Brian, and we were talking about doing a weekly study here. And, I'm, and, and he's like, yeah, you know, I'd like you to take over the Monday night study here. And I'm like, whoa, dude, Monday night study, dude. Like, that's all the big boys are there, you know? I'm like, I can't even read. Are you kidding me right now? You want me ADD, can't read, NLT version? Like, what? And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, man. And I was honestly like, dude, I got to pray. Because, like, if I, get, if I get up here and it's not you, God, this is going to be a disaster. And I just said, all right, well, let, let's pray. And then as I'm praying, I'm like, dude, I don't have peace about doing Monday night. How am I going to tell Brian I don't want to do Monday night? And, and I'm like, oh, man, that's like a hardcore conversation. I'm all shook, you know. And I'm like, but God was leading me, like, to do it. If I, if I were to do it, to do it another night. Yeah. Because... God was showing me that I, I leave on the weekends. I go out to skate events. I go on concerts. I want to be in the world on the weekends. Not of the world, but I want to be in the world. And then I could teach on Thursdays. So I could jump on a flight on Friday morning and be across the United States if I have to. So I'm like, how am I going to tell Brian? This dude off telling me to come in. What am I going to say? Oh, well, I don't want to do Monday, but Thursdays would be good. <laughs> so can you check your schedule and let me know? You know what I'm, You guys get what I'm putting down here, right? It's like gnarly. So I'm like, all right. God, I'm like, dude, okay, God, just fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me the boldness, and I'll just tell him. Just control my tongue, you know? So I'm, like, walking up to his office, and I'm all shook, and I, you know, I sit down, and I'm like, hey, Ryan, what's up, Ryan? I'm all nervous. And he's like, hey, Ryan, listen, before we even talk, just listen. I feel that you need to do, like, a Thursday night or something. <laughs> a th- when, you need to do, like, a Thursday night. Monday's not good. He's like, you need to be out with bands and different people on the weekends, man. He's like, God's called you to that ministry. You know, Thursday night or something would be good. You know, what do you think? And I'm like, Brian, I'm like, you took the words right out of my mouth because that's what God showed me. And I was scared to come in here and tell you that. Thank you. And my point is, you guys, when you're in tune with the spirit and you're following God, dude, he's working things out. He worked out that girl. He got us lost. He brought us together. He talked to Brian because the phone line He's talking, the, the same phone line, God's talking to me. He has, got, he has Brian's phone number. You know, that's why when people come up to you and say, hey, Ryan, um, you know, God told me that you shouldn't say this from stage because you always say these kind of things. And I'm like, well, you know what, to be honest, I go, God has my number. So if he wants me to say stuff, then not to say stuff, he'll tell me. And, and God, he has everyone's number. So that's, that's some faith stories, and I'm going to end it with this last faith story before we get back into this story. I'm only going to finish the story here tonight because we're almost done. But here's another thing that's been happening is I've been approached to do a book deal for about three, probably about two years now, and they've been hitting me up like, hey, you know, we want you to do a book and this, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. I don't got time to be writing no book, you know? Like, I can't even read or write. You want me to write a book? <laughs> what, some kind of sick joke, you know? And uh, I'm like, well, cool, cool. You know, when, one day when God hooks it up, I'll do the book. So we've been, I've been negotiating, you know, just meeting with ghostwriters and different people and stuff like that. And it's been two years. And finally, the guy's like, okay, we've got a ghostwriter for you. I met with him. like, yeah, the guy seems cool. And like, okay, let's do the book deal. And they're like, okay, but you need, you know, you need to up front. You need, like, like serious money, like thousands of dollars to, 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 do, to, to ghostwrite, to have a ghostwriter to write your book. And I'm like, I don't got that kind of money. Like, I got these, because you understand, I'm not like a big name, like a a celebrity where they were like, hey, you know, we're going to get guaranteed X amount of sales, so here's a, you know, here's a hundred grand to do your thing. So I'm like, well, I don't have the money. I told my wife, I'm like, well, whatever, dude. Like, if God wants me to write a book, he's going to provide, because I'm not cutting a check. We don't even have the money to cut no check. So, dude, like, probably like, um, I don't know, four or five months go by, then next thing you know, I get an email. Hey, um, the publisher, they're going to give you a check, an upfront check for X amount, which covers the ghostwriting of the book. So God provides in every single detail. But I could have went ahead of the game and got myself in the debt and, God, I'm going to do it by the flush. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to go get 20 grand or 30 grand or 40 or whatever, whatever the deal is and throw it down and I'm going to do it my way. And God's like, don't be stupid. I got you. Just relax. Take it easy. And then... <laughs> And then God, in his timing, comes in and goes, all right, there, there's the money. Now go write it. And for me, now I have confirmation, like, okay, God, it's time. Let's do this. Now baptize me and give me the words to to crank this thing out. So these are all stories, you guys. I'm, I'm nothing. Do you guys understand that? I just walk by faith. 
And we all have access to that. We just got to walk by faith and let God do his thing. And the most important thing is the patience, the waiting. I've been wanting to do a book for three years because I'm like, I want to do a book and send it to all the rehabs across the world. Like, I don't care if anyone else sees it, but rehabs. That's where my heart's at. I just want to go to the lost. But God's like, no, in timing, I want to bring back the music festival. Now God's starting to provide for that thing. We've got, we just booked the Irvine Amphitheater in, for June, 20, June 20th. Horizon Amphitheater. It's booked. We're working on headliners right now. That's booked. We wanted to get a building. God's providing for the building. We're looking for the building. So God, where God guides, God provides. And that's it. It's very simple, but we all have access to this. Okay, so now this is going to talk about Jesus doing more miracles. This is just a miracle that's in the Bible. Um, so they said, we have seven loaves. They replied to Jesus. So Jesus told all the people to sit down on the ground. And another gospel says that they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. This shows that God is a God of order. He's not a God of disorder. He's of order here. Then he took seven loaves, thanked God for them, and he broke them into pieces. So what, God, what they brought to God, God Jesus took them and, and, and gave them to God to, to bless them. And that's what we need to do. Even though this is only seven loaves, whatever we have in our lives, if we just have ourselves... We just say, God, do whatever you want with us. You know, you just gotta, you gotta talk to God to, to do his will. Um, he, gave them, he gave them to the disciples and he, distri he distributed the bread to the crowd. A few small fish were found too. So Jesus also blessed them and he, took them to, he told the disciples to distribute them. Uh, verse eight, they ate as much as they wanted. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven large baskets that were left over. So this is the way God normally works in our lives. Not only does God provide and he's in the details, but at the end when you walk away, you're like, dude, you, God, you did way more than I even thought. Like, oh my God, it'd be awesome. Six years ago, I was like, God, it'd be awesome to do a, a music festival to reach the world. That'd be awesome. But God's like, yeah, Ryan, we're going to do the music festival. We're going to do it annually. We're going to get a building we're going to do a shine, and another door just opened for me to do an hour show on KKLA radio station. They just offered me a radio station. He's like, and radio station, and this, and that. It's like, these guys walked away with seven baskets extra. When you follow God, he always gives you more than enough. He always gives you stuff that you wouldn't even believe. He blesses you so much. And it's not about material things, you guys. It's about spiritual things. And spiritual things is where we find our happiness. Because all that other junk, that stuff burns. You know the story with the car. Oh, I got a car, I'm happy. And then you're like, I got to tent the windows. Then you do it, and you're bummed, then you got to get the rims. And it's just, that's all temporal. It's all about spiritual. We have one life that will soon be passed, and whatever we do for Christ is the only thing that will last. That's, right. that's it. Papa Chuck said that, and that's it. Nothing else matters. Verse 8, they ate as much as they wanted afterwards, and the disciples picked up the seven large baskets um, on the, and let, oh, I'm sorry. They ate as much as they wanted. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven large bags, baskets of leftover food. They were all about 4,000 people in the crowd that day. And Jesus sent them home after they had eaten or they were glutton. In the King James Version it says, they were stuffed. And there was about 11 to 12,000 people. Verse 10, immediately after this, he got into the boat and with the disciples and crossed over the region of... What's that word? Dathamia? Dathamia, Dathamia, whatever. I don't know, you read it. Okay, so anyway, that was on the west side. That was where the, the, the Jewish quarter was, like the Jews were. And now they were crossing to the, uh, they were in the sea. Oh, I'm sorry, they were on the side, on the east side where the Galilees were. And now they're going to the Jewish quarters. And we'll pick up, not next Thursday, because we won't be here, but the following Thursday, we'll keep going through these Jesus stories. And the way I always do to end it, if there's anyone here that would like to receive Jesus Christ in their life, and you want to start a new life where you're not going, what do I do with my life? And you want to start getting in a zone with God and seeing what God wants to do with your life. And that's probably the dopest thing you'll ever experience because he wants to bless you. And I'm not talking about, you know, God wants to bless you with fat pockets, you know? He might you put a lot of chips in your pocket. That's awesome too. But God wants to bless you in so many ways you have no idea. He wants to, number one, bless you. He wants to forgive you for your sins. He wants to give you purpose, that empty void you have in your life. He wants to fill that. And then he wants to give you direction. And he wants to 
give you, he wants to lead you like a lamp on a path and he'll lead you and those crooked places in your life, he'll make them straight. That crooked path, how you keep going off and, and you're doing things that don't make you happy, he's gonna make your life straight, a direction to him where that's where you're gonna find peace. He says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you peace and rest for your soul. If you're weary, if you have a heavy heart and you're like, dude, I'm just heavy, I just feel this heaviness. Jesus says, I will give you peace and rest for your soul. And if you want peace and rest for your soul and forgiveness and the God of the universe to reach down and to pour his love on you and love you into eternity, and when, we all, when you die, one day you will, you'll be in eternity forever. Your name will be written in the book of life. That's what it says. When you give your life to Jesus, he writes your name in. He wrote my name in, Ryan Reese. Book of life, boom, I'm in heaven, done. Done skis, I'll see you up there. You know, I'm in, and I, and I ain't going anywhere else. I'm, I'm staying on that straight path. But if you want that for you, it's a free gift. You know, you may be saying, well, what do I got to do? Got to become a, a member of this church and start giving money? No, the price has been paid. <laughs> All you have to do is receive the gift. There's nothing you can do to get God's love. It's just free. You, you, there's no works going to church every week, giving money, you know, being a good person. You think, oh, I'm a good person. Good people don't go to heaven because there's no good people because our, e our hearts are evil. The only thing that's good is God, Jesus Christ. So if you want to receive Christ, you just give me a thumbs up and I want to pray for you and then we're going to end this night. It's that simple. Right on, guys. Anyone else? Right on. Cool. Right on. Anyone else? Anyone in the back? Throw them up. Cool. Right on. I see you too. Right on. I see you too. You in the back too? Right on. Cool. Where? Right there. Awesome. That's what it's all about. Okay. I want to lead you guys in a prayer, you guys. So you men and women, now I'm going to put you in your first step of faith. Your first step of faith is to actually step up out of your seat and walk down here and meet up with me. And I want to pray for you. This is the first step of faith. Yeah. Come now. Right on. Cruise on down. We're going to wait for you. I know there's a couple more in here. And you're thinking, man, my heart's beating. God, you know, what's going on? That's God knocking on your heart. He wants to come in, but he gave us free will. And he won't come in unless you open your heart. So you got to make that step of faith. Come down here, and I want to lead you in a prayer. So if your heart's racing, come down here. God's talking to you. The God of the universe is reaching down to you right now. And there might be some of you guys that are backslidden and you fell back and you've just walked away from God because life's crazy, culture's crazy. And you fall away and if you want to give your life back to God, come down here and I want to pray for you too. Just get fired up. Say, God, I want to be forgiven for my sins again. I want to get right on the right track. I don't want to be a spectator. I don't want to come here because Jesus makes me feel good. I want to actually have a relationship with God of the universe. Come down here. I want to pray for you. Cool, I see you coming. We're gonna wait for the last person. Cool, I'm gonna pray for you guys. Is there anyone else before we close this out? Last week there was a girl here that was like, my heart was pounding, I wanted to go up. If that's you, just come. There's always that last person that says, if that dude says it one more time, I'm gonna go. Right on. I see one more coming down. Excellent. Anyone else? Let's do this. It's cool. Right on. That's what's up. I want to pray before I pray with you guys because there might be a few more. Lord Jesus, I pray right now if there is that, that woman or that man that's sitting there in the chair, Lord, and you reach down, you're calling to them, God. I pray that you just reveal yourself to them right now, Lord. And you just, bring, you just lift them up and bring them forward. God, break any spiritual chains that are hooked to them by Satan. Maybe that they're, they're hearing Satan, those lies. Because those demons, they lie. They say, you don't need this. He's lying. This is just a bunch of crap. This is fake. Jesus doesn't exist. He didn't raise from the dead. We rebuke Satan in Jesus' name right now, God. If that person is hearing those lies, I pray that you draw that person right now forward, God. Bring them in the name of Jesus, God. Cover this place with your spirit. Pour out your spirit here in the name of Jesus. If you're here and you're hearing that stuff, come forward right now. Cool, right on. Anyone else? Cool, I'm gonna wait for you coming back up here right now too.
anyone else. I know the Spirit's moving right now, and He's tugging on people's hearts. Come up here before we leave here. Okay, we're going to pray. Okay, repeat this prayer after me. Guys, say, Jesus, please forgive me, Lord, for all my sins. I want to accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to follow you. And just baptize me with fire and power of the Holy Spirit. Be my God. Be my Lord. I love you. And thank you for forgiving me for my sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Okay. We want to give you guys that are receiving Christ for the first time, we want to give you guys a free Bible and show you where to read. You follow my boy right here, Kellen, right here? Right here in the name and blood shirt. Follow him. We're going to take five minutes and we're going to.